Well, welcome this evening to another Men's Theology Forum of the Eastern Panhandle. Tonight we have the distinct pleasure of happening of having Dr. Uh, Bradford Littlejohn. Brad is uh, a friend we've known each other for, an acquaintance friend. We've known each other for several years, a few years, uh, since my time in Moscow, Idaho. And several of you know of Brad and have followed some of his work that he's been doing over the years for uh, both the Davenant Institute, which he's the president of. He'll uh, speak a little bit more to, uh, to what they aim at doing, and, um, and a little bit about uh, some of the materials he's brought this evening at the beginning of his talk. But um, he is also a professor at, or assistant um, professor at pol of political theory at Patrick Henry College here in uh, Northern Virginia. He's authored and edited many books in the field of historical theology, including Peril and Promise of Christian Liberty and Reformation Theology, a, a reader of, of primary sources with introductions. Uh, and uh, tonight, we just uh, like to bring him up with some applause. <laughs> yeah, I would, we'd like to begin our time uh, with, with prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to have Dr. Little John with us this evening. We uh, pray that you would be with him in power and spirit and uh, that you would allow each one of us to be renewed in our minds through uh, your son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, yes, thank you so thank you much for Peter for having me here and uh, Lucas for inviting me. Um, a little word about the Davenant Institute. Uh, so this is a nonprofit organization that I founded, uh, I guess, a little over five years ago now. Uh, after I finished my PhD, with the aim of kind of connecting evangelical scholars and pastors to retrieve the riches of Protestant wisdom, basically taking some of the lost treasures of the Reformation and post-Reformation period and making them available in a form that can actually continue to speak to the church today. So uh, like one example of how we do that uh, is actually right here on the table. Uh, this is something we've just published Although we've, we've published sort of parts of it over the last couple of years, this is kind of bringing together. Um, my doctoral research was on a great English Reformed theologian named Richard Hooker. And because he wrote in English, nobody has bothered to translate him. But the problem is he wrote in 16th century English, and he was known to be a very difficult writer even by his contemporaries. So almost nobody reads him now. People read Luther and Calvin, because of course they've been translated to modern English, but they don't read Hooker because he wrote in almost unintelligible English. So... Uh, we've been translating his work into modern English, and that's what you see there on the table. Um, we also have some of these little books, one that I've written, I brought along, um, Doubted Guides, little sort of concise guides, kind of key themes in um, Protestant theology and ethics that aren't understood well enough. Um, we also do these little uh, booklets. I brought, again, one that I, I've written, um, Doubted Digests, and we do conferences and um, online courses and that sort of thing. So... Um, yes, but I teach... Can I pause you real quick? If yes. anybody would like to buy one and didn't bring any money, I'd be I happy to take, spot you this evening. I can also take credit cards. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so I teach political theory at Patrick Henry College, um, and Patrick Henry's motto is for Christ and for liberty. So I was actually asked to give their biannual faith and reason lectures last fall, and I proposed to you know, like uh, being, the, being the new kid on the block there, freshly hired, I decided to uh, take the modest goal of, of posing the question of whether their motto was coherent. So I, my lecture was um, called on, on Christ and Liberty. And um, how, can we, how can we as Christians be committed both to serving Christ and to the pursuit of freedom, um, particularly freedom as understood or or particularly given that freedom is now understood in our culture largely as freedom to believe or do whatever you want. Right? So um, I wanted to begin with uh, reading a little a little article that appeared in the a little um, opinion piece that appeared in the Loudon what is this Loudon Loudon Times Mirror last week. So um, here we go. Patrick Henry College in Purcellville, nicknamed God's Harvard by author Hannah Rosen is a deeply conservative evangelical school. So why does it not have a speech code that protects the liberties of its students? 
evangelical and conservative titans, namely Vice President Mike Pence and Fox News' Tucker Carlson, have graced Patrick Henry College's campus. Its namesake, founding father and former governor of Virginia, Patrick Henry, is the man behind the saying, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry College appears to have the give me liberty part down pat, considering its founder, Michael Ferris, is a champion of evangelical religious freedoms. But when it comes to free speech at Patrick Henry College, the policy is not clear cut. The college's student life manual features a one sentence description, not about its policy, but rather the desired tone of speech. It reads, students' communication, both written and verbal, is to be respectful at all times. But who decides what is respectful? Patrick Henry College needs a speech code offering the same freedom to speech as its founder does to religion. That speech code might prevent controversies like that in 2012, when a blog titled Queer at Patrick Henry College, which shared experiences of being gay at school, gained notoriety on campus. Ferris told the Loudoun Times Mirror, we don't think there are any such students on campus, in reference to homosexuals. Ferris temporarily threatened to sue the blog's authors for violating the school's copyright law for unauthorized use of its name. One might be forgiven in thinking Ferris's anger derived from the blog's content, not its alleged copyright infringement. The blog was reportedly banned from the school's Wi-Fi network. Patrick Henry College's speech code should consider speech as one of the liberties for which its namesake offered to die. After all, according to a 2018 Gallup Knight Foundation poll, only 29% of national college students surveyed said they would prefer a positive learning environment that limits free speech. The majority, 70%, favor a community allowing all sorts of speech. Ferris even relied on freedom of speech to win an argument for the Supreme Court in 2018. Skipping forward a bit. Patrick Henry College should follow its founder's lead in guaranteeing free speech for its students. In a 20, 2006 interview, Ferris says, in reference to liberal schools administrations, the crowd of tolerance wants to ban speech. He offered the example that those on traditionally liberal college campuses are slapped with hate speech punishments when they express anti-homosexuality beliefs. He said those who want to create hate speech codes and who want to silence those who criticize homosexuality are enemies of free speech. But, per Ferris's logic, anyone who discusses and questions sexuality is also exercising free speech, just like the queer at Patch Henry authors. Patch Henry College cannot drive both ways on the highway of free speech. It must fully allow for robust, open debate on campus. That includes not threatening legal action against homosexual students for creating a blog. It is the logical responsibility of a college founded on the bedrock of freedom and named after one of its greatest champions to protect the free speech of its students. Patrick Henry College's Student Life Manual must offer the same free speech liberties its founder relies on. To deny such liberties would stand in direct opposition of its own values. Now then, what is wrong with this picture? They don't want to volunteer any holes they might see in the logic of the opinion piece. Peter. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a private institution. Okay, it's a private institution. <laughs> you can tell people not to do whatever they want as long as they sign up to, you know, and agree to that. Okay. Your authority. All right. So, um, right. Within, that's the within reason. Yeah. So the most obvious counter is to say, okay, Patrick Henry, the namesake, was concerned with political liberty, he was concerned with um, the, the, well, in, in his case, the, the, uh, the King of England, far across the ocean, uh, giving, limiting the liberties of the American colonies. Not even there, if we went into it, the history class, but you know, then I would point out that he wasn't even actually concerned with anything like liberty in this sense. But even so, the liberty he's talking about is liberty that a political authority is trying to impose on the entire trying to restrict the entire nation, not, he's not saying that that give me liberty or give me death necessarily applies at every single level of authority. In fact, quite famously, uh, Patrick Henry is one of the anti-federalists who insisted that one of the liberties he was most concerned about was the liberty of states, liberty of states to set their own policies that not to be um, bound by the same rules as the national government. And so that's one of those liberties at the time was liberty of states to curtail the liberties of 
black slaves, right? So he was actually fine with states limiting liberties. He just didn't want the national government to limit some of those liberties. Uh, and in fact, Patrick Henry was a supporter of continued religious establishment in Virginia. He wanted the Anglican Church to remain the official state church of Virginia, unlike Madison and Jefferson, who argued on the basis of freedom of speech that they shouldn't be required to support with their tax money um, a church that, that wasn't their own church. So as a historical claim about Patrick Henry, the man, saying the college needs to live up to its namesake, it breaks down pretty quickly. His na the namesake was in no way a champion of the kind of liberal individualist freedom that um, this author is. But also, the point is, why should the liberty that applies to, that, that we argue for vis-a-vis -vis the national government necessarily apply also to a college? Well, one argument would be to say, as Peter said, well, um, the reason why it's okay for a college to limit freedom of speech and not for a government to limit freedom of speech is because um, the people chose to go to the college. They signed up to go to it. They didn't choose to be born into a certain nation. They're kind of stuck with it. And since you're stuck with the nation that you're born into, the nation needs to be a little bit more restrained in what it asks of you. Okay. Um, but I would suggest this is not perhaps, this isn't enough of an answer because um, we don't say, if that's the only reason, if it's, well, people agreed to accept this harsh regime of, of uh, restraining their liberty of speech, and therefore that's fine, um, why should we be okay with institutions requiring that as a standard of admission? Why should we say institutions can force their students to uh, give up their liberty in order to go to that institution? After all, we don't allow people to sell themselves into slavery. We don't say, well, look, the person freely chose to sell themselves into slavery, and so they're a slave now, right? We believe that there's a certain good to freedom such that no one should be, even be able to freely give up certain freedoms. And so if freedom of speech is really this wonderful good, then it seems like you shouldn't even be able to freely sign up to join a community that restricts your freedom of speech. So, um, why then, I think for all of us, it seems like communities like colleges, like churches, schools, have to have rules that limit in some ways their members' freedom. That seems, I think most of us would say, would say that seems kind of intuitively obvious, but why? Why do they need that? And then why are we okay with that if we are fans of freedom? That's what I want us to kind of explore tonight, and then particularly how we think about that as Christians. So I want to think, uh, talk about three, talk about the concept of freedom in, in sort of three different pairings. The first will be individual versus corporate liberty. And by the way, I'm going to use the words freedom and liberty just interchangeably. Distinction. So individual versus corporate liberty, a corporate, not in the sense of like a corporation, but just in the sense of a, a community, a, um, a, an institution. Um, negative versus positive liberty. So individual versus corporate, negative versus positive, and then Christian versus political liberty. All right. So... <coughs> Let's first individual versus corporate liberty. So let's look back at this op-ed and approach it from another direction, all right? The article doesn't actually say very much about how it is that PhD is being so terrible and restraining freedom of speech. Um, but let's talk about some obvious ways in which it does, okay? Um, it's, 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 it's actually striking the article could have, um, could have done a lot more if it wanted to, to paint Patrick Henry as this, you know, repressive, uh, you know, puritanical place. So students at Patrick Henry have to sub subscribe to a statement of faith. They have to say these are, and, and a code of conduct. They say, as a Christian, I affirm these truths. I agree to live in a Christ-like way. And I, and I agree not to 
not, you know, not only do I affirm these truths, but obviously in affirming these truths, I agree not to undermine these truths in the, in the way that I uh, live or speak as a student, right? I can't be a student at Patrick Community College and start um, handing out, you know, atheist tracts. You know, if, 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 I, if I decide to become an atheist, I, I have to leave the school, right? So, is this a good thing? Is it a good thing that Patrick Henry has a statement of faith like that? Do we all think so? Yes. Interactive audience here, okay, sorry. Yes. Right, um, yes. yes, okay, all right. So why is this a good thing? And why is it a good thing for the community to limit the freedom of its members, right? It's one thing to say, well, it should be allowed to, it's a private school, you know, it should be allowed to do it. But, you know, we allow people to do things that we don't think are good things. We actually think this is a good thing. It is a good thing for the school to limit the freedom of its students to a certain statement of faith. Why is that good? Well, John Stuart Mill, the English political philosopher who's been profoundly influential on um, modern ways of thinking about freedom, definitely did not think this was a good thing, okay? For John Stuart Mill, it was not enough. Liberty did not merely mean being free from the intervention of the law, okay? You could lose your freedom. Obviously, you could lose your freedom by being thrown into prison for doing something. But he recognized, I think more insightfully, I think a lot of libertarians say, well, the only freedom, the only coercion that we're concerned with, the only constraint that we're concerned with, the only thing we want to assert liberty against is the state. But everything else is voluntary. And John Stuart Mill said, well, that's not really true. Society has lots of very powerful ways of constraining people without actually locking them up in prison. The social, the forces of peer pressure, social disapproval, um, the ways in which communities can, can shun members who don't uh, live up to certain expectations. These are all very powerful ways in which communities can limit the liberty of individuals. Okay? And, and of course, this is... Um, he, Think about now with people who are, you know, championing, um, you know, sexual liberty. When they recognize this, right? They they say, you know, Christians are oppressive. We're like, we're not, we're not, we're not throwing gays in prison, you know. But they're like, no, the very fact that you are showing disapproval is is a restraint on these people's liberty, right? So John Stuart Mill recognized that strong social forces of social disapproval are limitations on liberty. Okay, so. Patrick Henry College is limiting the liberty of its students. Why do we think this is a good thing? I would suggest the reason that we, I think, would recognize that it's a valuable thing is because this limitation of the individual liberties of students is necessary for the college to achieve its mission, its purpose. It's supposed to be a Christian school. I mean, if it, if it didn't want to be a Christian school, then it doesn't need to have a you know, a statement of faith. And it could be, you know, it could be very good technical school. It could be very good uh, school for languages or pre-law or whatever. But that's not what the school is trying to achieve. It is trying to specifically equip Christian leaders. And if it's going to achieve that mission, it has to prevent members of the school from acting in ways that fundamentally undermine that mission, right? If you think about, you know, a family... You know, if you, you know, if, my, if we're thinking to ourselves, we've got, um, you know, we can go on a, a day trip this Saturday. Where are we going to go? Are we going to go to Harper's Ferry? Are we going to go to Manassas Battlefield or whatever? And one of the kids wants to go one place. Another kid wants to go another place. Well, for the family to be free to do, we, we can say, well, we need to respect the liberty of all the children. And some of the children want to go here. Some of the children want to go there. And so we're not going to go anywhere because then that would be, limiting the freedom of one of our children. Well, no, actually, for the family to be able to do something that actually makes the family as a whole happier, we have to say, we're gonna do this, and some of you aren't gonna be happy with it, some of you are gonna be happy with it, but all of you, in the end, are gonna be happier that we did something, that we did nothing. So, similarly, if a school wants to have a mission, wants to accomplish a Christian educational mission, then it has to say, look, this is the direction that we're going, and if you are at this school, you're going to go this direction, all right? Um, and this is true of churches as well, okay? This is part of why um, I think, you know, some people are like, well, why can't 
you know, why do churches have creeds and confession? Why can't we all just like agree to say we, you know, we love Jesus? Well, we should, as Christians, love anyone who loves Jesus. But to function as a church, there are all kinds of decisions that have to be made about how we're going to do certain things, how we're going to order the service, what, what sermons are going to be like, what the ministries are going to be like, what the liturgy is going to be like. There are all kinds of actions we have to take as a community, and that requires that people be kind of on the same page. And we can say, look, if you come here, you need to accept that these are the rules, and your freedom is going to be limited. You're, you're not free to believe this anything if you come to this church. Or you're not free to actively undermine the beliefs of this church, right? So what I'm getting at here is for the institution to be free, to be free to actually act, to achieve certain goals, requires that the members of that institution have their freedom limited in some way. This is true for colleges, for schools, for churches, for families, and even for nations. Okay? How much actually? I'm probably wow. Well, Don't worry about time. I'm gonna worry about time. Um, I'm gonna say something. I'll just um, read what I have here because it'll be faster to read it than if I spell it. Um, so I would say we we also need to make the point that the things that people value most are social goods. Okay, the things we value most. We think we deceive ourselves in large society thinking the things that I care about most are my own individual loves and preferences. But that's not really true. The things I care about most are the things that I see. Um, give me a sense of belonging, right? I can know that I'm loved and respected by other people, that I'm, that I'm part of this community that has meaning, that I have this identity by being part of something larger than myself. That's what actually gives people happiness. And to have identity and to belong to a group means abiding by certain norms of behavior, means limiting my freedom. And I think a great deal of the disorientation that many modern Americans feel is the disorientation of being told that they should be free to define their own reality and pursue their own choices. And that's actually not what most people really want. What most people want is to feel like they are part of a larger reality. They're not just defining their own reality. Okay. So, everyone kind of with me on the individual versus corporate liberty, recognizing that for a community to be free to do something means the individuals within it, to that extent, might not be as free. But in a sense, they are freer because they're, they, or they might, I mean, they're not freer, but they might be happier because they actually have a sense of belonging. So this gets us to the second thing I want to consider, which is positive liberty versus negative liberty. So this phrasing comes from um, another English political philosopher, uh, Isaiah Berlin, who gave a, a famous lecture in 1958 on this. So Berlin... Um, wanted to kind of say, what is it that makes the modern Western liberal ideal of liberty special? Um, lots of people throughout history have talked about freedom. What makes our idea of freedom different? Um, and what makes it, what protect, what, what, what keeps us in the, in the sort of Western world, this is of course in a Cold War context, what differentiates us from the totalitarianism of the Eastern Bloc? <laughs> well, he said, the, the thing is, we have this idea of negative liberty, and they actually, you know, we, we think of Soviet Russia, they didn't care about liberty at all. But he's like, actually, you look at their propaganda, they do. They talk about liberty, but it's, but it's positive liberty. He calls positive liberty. So, what is negative liberty? Well, negative liberty is liberty of non-interference, okay? Freedom means not someone not tampering with you, someone not limiting your options, Okay. Um, it designates, as he says, the area within which the subject is or should be left to do or be what he is able to do or be without interference by other persons. Okay? The area within which anyone should be left free to do or be whatever they want to do or be, whatever, or at least whatever they're able to do or to be. Um, and of course, now, right, the, 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 the able is being constantly expanded by technology. You know, it used to be, no one would have said in 1958, well, my freedom is limited because I can't be a woman. But like Berlin would say, well, no, if you're not able to be a woman because you're a man. And now it's like, well, you can't be a woman if you get the surgery, right? So now if you don't let me do that, my freedom is being limited, right? Okay, so Berlin says, now, of course, this kind of freedom, freedom not to be interfered with, this doesn't automatically lead to a sort of libertarian utopia because 
you can't let, I can't be allowed to do whatever I want because that might, you know, if I want to steal all of your beer, right, that would be limiting your freedom, right? So, yes, sir. <laughs> so limiting, so protecting individual liberty, native liberty, means limiting individual native liberty, at least somewhat, right? I can't exercise, you can't leave me free to do something that takes away your freedom. But still, he thinks this is, on the whole, this is the right track. He wants this idea of negative liberty, freedom of non-interference. Interfere with individuals as little as possible. Okay. Now, the second kind of liberty that he notes, though, which he says is very common throughout human history, is this idea of positive liberty. He says, um, concerns the source of control or interference that can determine someone to do or be this rather than that. Okay, um, the the first the, the first kind of liberty is sort of about I, I am free because the world does not put limitations on me. The second kind of liberty, possibility, is about me, the agent. Am I, as Brad, actually free? And that means we have to actually think, look psychologically. Are there things within me that are limiting my freedom? You guys might not be limiting my freedom, but am, am I limiting my own freedom? Am I actually achieving my freedom? Okay. Um, for the former, the reasons why I act have nothing to do with my freedom, right? I can act for stupid reasons. I can act for smart reasons. I can act for no reason at all. And I should be left alone to act for whatever reason it is. And, and as long as I'm, as long as no one is interfering, I'm free. But for the proponents of positive liberty, why I act is absolutely crucial, right? To, to act, right? I mean, the word action really doesn't just mean, you know, just like randomly flailing my limbs. Acting means having a purpose, means, means pursuing an end, okay? And so if I am acting out of bondage to my desires, if I am, if I am, if I am, if I am, if I am addicted to something, then that action is not actually a free action. Nobody else is interfering with me, but I am not actually acting freely because I am not acting purposefully. I'm not choosing to act as I would want to act, okay? Um, so from the standpoint of positive liberty, the goal is I wish to be a subject, not an object, to be moved by reasons, by conscious purposes, which are my own, not by causes which affect me as it were from the outside. From this standpoint, to act thoughtlessly or in response to enslaving passions is not actually to be free. Okay, I'm going to stick close to my manuscript now so I actually move faster. Okay. Um, okay, so now I've developed this concept of relation to the individual, but the same goes for communities, all right? Plato made this analogy way back at the beginning of the Western philosophical tradition, right? In the Republic, he says the city is like the soul. And Plato is primarily, he's looking at the concept of justice, but we could actually take what Plato says about justice and talk about it in terms of freedom, okay? He's that the individual soul for Plato is free to realize its proper purpose when it overcomes the rowdier passions that pull it in the wrong directions. Similarly, for Plato, a community or a city is free to realize its proper purpose to the extent that it can discipline its rowdier members and convince them to get on board. All right. Um, it's funny. We actually don't really think about the fact that we use the word member, of course. You know, we just know, you know, you guys are members of a church, and we forget that this was originally a metaphor, right? Coming, kind of, you know, members. We don't use the word members so much in terms of members of my body, you know. But member originally meant like a limb of the body, and the community was understood so much as like a body, and the and the the, it, the people within the community were parts of the body in the way that my arms are parts of me. So the word member was used for members of the community. And now we just think of it as, you know, that's what it means, right? But it was very close analogy, right? So you, you have, you know, you have roundier emotions and parts of your body that you need to keep under control if you're actually going to be free. And maybe you need to cut them off, Jesus said, if you're going to stay free, right? Similarly, a community might need to discipline or even cut off certain of its members to stay free, right? Now, Berlin said, from this standpoint, from Plato's standpoint, whatever is the true goal of man must be identical with his freedom, okay? 
my true misconception, anything that keeps me from actually achieving my real purpose is impairing my freedom, whether it comes from you guys or whether it comes from within me. Now, Berlin is concerned that this notion of positive liberty can turn into totalitarianism. In fact, it often has. He notes that many of the most repressive societies have justified their actions as an attempt to enable their members to achieve their true purpose and thus be truly free. Okay? You know, that, um, you know, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, the idea was we are helping you become your, your true, become a true German or become a true member of the proletariat and really and achieve your real goal and purpose. Therefore, we are liberating you from these constraints that are holding you back. Now, Berlin says that actually, there's nothing illogical about this concept. It is true that if there is something that is the true goal of my life, the source from which I'm going to find happiness, and there are things outside of me, things within me, things that are keeping me from achieving that true goal, then helping me overcome those things, even sometimes forcing me to overcome those things, is actually a way of enabling my freedom. That's actually <laughs> logical. He says the problem Berlin sees is he says that these projects claim to have discovered the truth for mankind, the good, right? There is a certain ideal of this is what mankind really needs and we are going to make it happen. And Berlin says nothing of that sort is available to us. We don't know what the truth is. We don't know what the good is. And so we must let a thousand flowers bloom, a thousand different experiments in the good life. Now, what should we as Christians think about this? I think we, like Berlin, would be very concerned about the totalitarian society that tries to force freedom on people. And yet, as Christians, if, if you permit, the Book of Common Prayer has a, a, prayer, has a famous line, to serve him is perfect freedom. Right? This idea that our freedom is actually found in obedience to God. Our freedom is found not, not in being left alone to do whatever we want or act on whatever basis that, we, what, that might occur to us, but our freedom is found in disciplining ourselves in service of God. And, there, and, our, and churches that help us do that and, and that discipline us for not doing that, parents that discipline us for not doing that, are actually helping us achieve our freedom. So we would say we do know the truth and the good. We do know the true goal of human existence that enables real flourishing and real freedom. We know that to any freedom to disobey God is actually a form of slavery. So then, is the Christian vision of freedom actually totalitarian, as many moderns would accuse us. <laughs> well, this requires looking more closely at the idea of Christian liberty. What is Christian liberty? Now, for many Christians, nowadays we talk about it, what I just did right there was a textbook example of Christian liberty. I show that I am, I have Christian liberty, I am free to drink, I was free to smoke a cigar out back later. Okay, maybe some would say invoke it in the context of dating versus courtship. They're free to do either. Free, they're free to dance. They're free in their choice of music. Okay, so the way the term is often used nowadays is is very much in terms of the kind of the idea of negative liberty that we talked about. Right, Christian liberty is our celebration of divine non-interference. Okay, of God leaving us alone to choose our own pursuits in anything that is neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture. Right now, God does live in our liberty in a number of things, but thankfully he doesn't live in our liberty in everything. And so that is what the Christian liberty is. Whatever he leaves us, you know, that, that little, whatever that little space is, you know, depending on what denomination you are, it's a small space, or it's a big space, but whatever that space is, that's what we call Christian liberty. Right? Now, the problem is... Um, Oh, oh, so we often think, by extension, that if God left us alone, left us free there, gave us this liberty, then nobody else is allowed to take it away from us, right? Sorry. So it's actually very interesting how this plays out in conversations about Lent. Does your church practice Lent? Yeah, my church does. Okay, well, yes, yeah, right. So, um, so <laughs> actually, and, and 
historically church that practiced Lent that would not that would not have been okay, right? Um, because well, I don't know, was abstaining from alcohol? I guess it depends. I mean, certainly, certainly couldn't enjoy sausages, right? Um, now it's interesting. Protestant churches now that are trying in America that are trying to recover the idea of Lent are very kind of freaked out and nervous when they talk about it because they're like, we don't want to be taking away Christian liberty. Okay, so we don't want to say you have to do Lent at all, which is saying it might be a good idea, you know, if you want to do it, but, you know, free to do whatever you want. Um, because we think Christian liberty is not only a negative liberty, liberty not interference, but is understood in terms of it, individual liberty, okay? God left individuals free to do what they want here, and so nobody else can take that freedom away. But I think if we were actually consistent in that train of thought, then this would be crippling to the freedom of communities or institutions, right? As we saw earlier, for an institution to be able to achieve some goals, everyone has to be on the same page to some extent, right? And so an institution says, if, if we as an institution are going to be free to observe Lent together, then that means you guys all need to do it, right? And this is actually the, the way we think about liberty now is, oh, God left us alone, so you can't, nobody can tell what to do. That's not how the reformers thought about Christian liberty. Richard Hooker actually said that this idea of liberty, even if applied no further than this particular issue that he was talking about, shakes the universal fabric of government, leads to anarchy and confusion, dissolves families, dissipates colleges, corporations, and armies, overthrows kingdoms, churches, and anything that is now, according to God's providence, upheld by power and authority. Right? So his point is, Right. You see that families, colleges, corporations, armies, kingdoms, churches, any kind of community that requires structure, that requires uh, norms that bind its members would be incapable of functioning if it were true that as long as God leaves us alone, nobody else can constrain us. Right. Um, was I gonna... Oh, I was going to. Oh, yeah, I love that. So, I mean, just give an example. Right. Um, most churches, most churches have some kind of liturgy, all right? Now, I mean, there are churches that really do try and do this. They're like, you know, whatever you feel led by the Spirit to do, just do it. Sorry. You know, whatever you feel led by the Spirit to do, you know, get up and dance down the aisles, you know, start prophesying, whatever. But most churches say, well, no, 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 no. Um, this is the hymn book we're going to use, okay? We're going to use this hymn book, and you're not free. That means that you do not have the freedom to just walk into church with a different hymn book and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start singing big hymn number 659 right now, and just belt it out the top of your mouth, right? No, you got to sing the hymn the bulletin says you're going to sing. Now, does that mean that your Christian liberty is being violated? Or does that mean you have to say the Bible required? No, the Bible doesn't require you to sing hymn 347 right now, but the church does require that you sing hymn 347 right now, and that's not a violation of your Christian liberty, okay? So, Let's quote, there's a, there was a, um, actually a, a, a sort of confession of what do we mean by Christian liberty by a set of Dutch churches in London in 1567. They said, Christian liberty is not a wandering and unruly license by which we may do or leave undone whatsoever we will at our pleasure, but it is a free gift bestowed upon us by Christ our Lord by which the children of God being delivered from the curse of the law or eternal death and from the heavy yoke of the ceremonial law and being endowed with the Holy Ghost, begin willingly of their own accord to serve God in holiness and righteousness. Now we can elaborate this by looking at John Calvin's statement. John Calvin gives a, a threefold definition of Christian liberty. So there's, there's, there's three parts of Christian liberty. The first, he said, is that the consciences of believers in seeking assurance of their justification before God should rise above and beyond, advance beyond the law. Forgetting all law of righteousness. Okay, so forget works, getting a past works righteousness is the first part of Christian liberty. The second part, which depends on the first, is that consciences do still observe the law, but not as if constrained by the necessity of the law, but that free from the law's yoke, they willingly obey God's will. For since they dwell in perpetual dread, so long as they remain under the sway of the law, they will never be disposed with eager readiness. To obey God unless they've been given this sort of freedom. So he's saying here, okay, we don't we don't uh, seek our justification in the works of the law, but we still do do the works of the law, but we do them with a different mindset. We do them not out of fear and dread, but out of willing, joyful 
grateful obedience. So it's a, it's a, we're still doing the same thing, but with a totally different mindset, with a free mindset, right? So this, you can see here more of the idea of positive liberty. It's, it's an inward liberty. It's not the saying you, you still got to do the law, but you don't think of it that way. You, think of, you don't think I have to do the law. You think I get to do the law, and that makes a big difference. The third part of liberty, says Calvin, of Christian freedom, lies in this. Regarding outward things that are of themselves indifferent, okay, like drinking and dancing. Well, I don't know what Calvin thought about dancing, but drinking. We are not bound before God by any religious obligation preventing us from sometimes using them and other times not using them indifferently. Now, this last one finally looks more like the Christian liberty that we were talking about. I, I just said it's a bit more like that. But even that is something of a misunderstanding. Okay? Because Calvin says, he says, regarding outward things that are of themselves indifferent, okay, that is to say, neither commanded or forbidden in Scripture, we are not bound before God by any religious obligation preventing us from sometimes using them and other times not using them. And the key words here are before God and religious obligation. Calvin thought you could be, so actually, for instance, this is an example I was just giving my students, I guess, yeah, we were just talking about this class Wednesday, yeah, there we go. Um, so, uh, this actually, actually this, this, at least I'll give a slightly different example, this actually came up in England in the, in the, in the 1500s, right? Which was, um, they had said no meat and Lent, no meat during Lent. Okay, that was the church's the church's law. The state upheld the church's law. Okay, you could be excommunicated and you could be fined. I don't know exactly what the civil penalty was, but if you were eating meat during Lent, now you could eat fish, right? And and in fact, people ate lots of fish. And the fishermen loved Lent because this is when they made a lot of their profits was during Lent. Okay. The Reformation comes along and it's like, yeah, hey, you don't actually have to do this. You don't have to fast for meat during Lent anymore. And the fishing industry plummets, right? And so there's actually laws saying, you, or, or there was at least discussion, I can't remember if there actually was, the discussion of, well, maybe we need to actually put some laws back in place saying uh, only fish during this period. And the, some of the reformers in England said, that's actually fine if the purpose of the law is to support the fishing industry. We can debate over whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but it's not a violation of Christian liberty. Because you're not saying this is a religious obligation. You're not saying before God. You're just saying as a matter of economics, as they understood it, this is a good idea, right? So Calvin's saying Christian liberty means not no one can say this is what you need to do to please God. But they can say this is what you need to do in order to you know, make, ensure the, the orderly functioning of this community, right? Um, so you shouldn't say... We all need to use the Contus Christi because that is the most the hymnal that is most pleasing to God. But you can say we all need to use the Contus Christi because we got to use one hymnal, and we think this is you know we think this is the most useful one for our community. So that's the one we're going to use. Um, so neither Calvin nor any of the reformers shied away from governments or church authorities doing a great deal that we would consider interfering with people's liberty. The popular character of Calvin as a repressive disciplinarian is not false as such. It's just that Calvin wasn't unique. Everybody was kind of a repressive disciplinary back then by our standards, right? So then, finally, sorry, bring it home, and what you really want to know. Okay, can Christians be for freedom in the sense that Berlin talks about it, you know? Or do we have to be kind of totalitarians, right? Can we be for liberal freedom as we... In the, in the older sense of liberal. I think there are a couple ways in which you can. I'll just sketch them briefly here. Um, especially as Protestants. Okay? The first is to say that although Christianity does claim to have discovered the truth and the good, right? Remember we said that was, for Berlin, that was the problem with positive liberty. The idea that anyone could say, this is the truth, this is the good of human nature, and so we are helping you be free, Right? Christians say, we do know the truth and the good. But as Protestants, we insist that this truth can only be grasped and this good can only be achieved by faith. Okay? There's, you can't be, therefore, you can't be forced into it. Right? It just doesn't work by definition. There's no way you can make someone be more 
have Christian liberty because Christian liberty means consistent justification by faith, right? And you can't make someone have saving faith. So rightly understood, Protestantism actually rips the rug right out from underneath all the totalitarian projects that Isaiah Berlin is really concerned about. Neither the church nor the state has any business forcing people to become truly free. That's simply impossible. At best, all you can achieve is outward conformity, okay? And you can debate how much you should or shouldn't try to achieve outward conformity, but the goal there is not enabling people to become truly free, because you're not. Now, the second thing to say is that human authorities, so they're not justified in restraining freedom in in order to help people achieve their true salvific, in order to achieve their true salvific end. They are justified in restraining individual freedom in the name of the common good. As we said, you know, an organization has to limit the freedom of its members to the extent that it wants to achieve certain purposes rather than others. Now, but the thing is, we would also, the other thing we want to say as Christians is that this temporal common good has not been authoritatively revealed in the gospel. The Bible does not give us a comprehensive blueprint for this is all the ways in which you achieve the optimal society in every context. Okay, it gives us general guidelines, but those guidelines have to be pursued prudentially, which means the person trying, even the person who is trying to actually govern in a, in a biblical way, can make mistakes. They can make plenty of mistakes. All right, and sometimes they will even err very badly in commanding us to do things that God actually forbids us to do. And Christianity has always taught that we must obey God rather than men. That sovereignty belongs not to law, but to truth. And that every citizen is responsible to exercise a critical intelligence to think for themselves as a Christian as to, does God actually want me to do this thing or not? Okay, so there's nothing intrinsically violating my liberty for um, the, a ruler to say, you know, the performers used to say, there's nothing intrinsically violating my Christian liberty for a ruler to say, uh, you need to buy fish right now to help out the, you know, the uh, the fishermen. But I'm not allowed to actually think for myself and say I don't actually think that is what God requires me to do in this situation. In fact, I think He requires me to do otherwise. Um, and this has major consequences for individual freedom. When you've taught your people to critically examine the laws rather than simply passively yielding to them, you will have to govern more modestly. You will have to accept the reality of disagreement and refrain from passing laws that will be unconvincing and thus unenforceable. So as Oliver Donovan says, Christianity, particularly Protestantism, teaches that each person has, has, not is, his own master. And his master is not the ruler who governs him in the order of civil society. There are some judgments that may be evident enough, but which do not fall to the ruler to make. The ruler has to establish a prima facie interest in the implications for civil order before intervening between any man or woman and the God who commands. Now, the key word is has, not is his own master. Okay, this is the key difference between Christian freedom and the nihilistic freedom of modernity, which claims that each individual has the right to define his own concept of existence and the meaning of human life. We as Christians can say, no, we do not have that freedom. Well, the service of God is perfect freedom. But for that very reason, that poses a limit on how much any merely human authority can claim to restrict it.